So welcome again for everyone joining this webinar. We'll have 45 minutes on crisis as an opportunity and what it is that you as a leader can do to successfully manage a crisis. My name is Arndt Pechstein and I'm in Berlin running an innovation agency on disruption, on innovation and on cultural change. And just a few words about my background. I have a background, a PhD in neuroscience, where I studied how we learn, how memory works. I then moved on to study complex adaptive systems. What can we learn from biological systems, from nature, to abstract these principles to solve our problems? I moved then into design thinking, user-centered and human-centered innovation and agile approaches, and eventually also combine this with exponential organizations, with exponential technologies. And that proves to be very relevant in times like Corona. Now, talking about this, this is something we just experienced firsthand right now, exponential development. And that is nothing new to us, actually, because it's not only viruses that follow this trajectory, but it is also technologies, for instance, and social technologies, social interactions. So what you see here is the blue curve that depicts exactly that development, an exponential growth of, for instance, technologies, but also viruses. And what this does is that it contradicts our thinking. We're thinking in linear ways and we cannot think differently as an individual, but what happens with us, our surrounding develops with an exponential change and exponential um, uh, curve and that creates a wider and wider gap between what we think will happen and what actually happens and the latest example of that dynamic if you wish is what we see in the COVID-19 crisis I've just overlaid here an image that we are all very familiar with we see here on the green curve actually um, the Chinese development and we see in the very early stage they had a very fast exponential growth as well but then through drastic measures they contained this growth and sustained it and now can sustain actually a low number of new infected and dying people whereas in Europe or the rest of the world we see a continuous rise of these numbers and exponential growth of cases and also of fatalities so how do we deal with this as a leader how do we deal with this as society but equally how do we deal with this as an organization. And it's not only important to know what we do right now in the moment of crisis, but what is it actually that the crisis can teach us about changing our organizations fundamentally and why? Because in the future, we don't want to be shocked like we are now on a global scale regarding the corona crisis, but we want to be better prepared and we want to use this crisis as an opportunity to really do this rethinking of our organization so what i've put together is are basically 12 behaviors and principles that you need to know as leaders to manage but also to learn from a crisis i've based it on the pillar of the vuca world and most of you have probably heard and come across this term we knew it before this crisis happened VUCA is an acronym standing for volatility, so everything changes constantly. For uncertainty, that is created through this volatility, so we don't know how to handle this unpredictability. About the complexity, because if more and more information comes together, if more and more things converge, the complexity grows exponentially. And ambiguity, that means I cannot possibly have all information, so I need to take decisions on an incomplete set of information now how do we use this as an opportunity and not as a threat and this is something that i call hybrid thinking and i've structured this input about leadership principles on four pillars how do we work with volatility as an opportunity well we start creating a transformative purpose we create a vision if everything around us changes we need something that gives people guidance, that gives people a direction, and that we align our priorities, our strategy on. Now let's come to the first principle of good leaders, and that is seeing things for what they are. 
Now, if you look at the current Corona crisis, we see two different type of leaders that are basically on opposite ends of a scale. And this is also the nice thing of a crisis. It reveals good or bad leadership. So on the left hand side, we see the president of the United States, and we all know him from previous politicians, decision making and behaviors. But in this particular case, in the Corona crisis, he really downplayed the risks for public health in the beginning. He blamed first China, then the European Union, then also the Democrats, making this just as a hoax. Basically, the Corona crisis would just be a hoax or a media hoax. Uh, and it really exposes his narcissism and ignorance towards the facts, towards what already happened elsewhere on the, on the planet. And it's really about uh, his inability to engage with the details and his inabilities to distinguish facts from wishful thinking. On the other hand, we see leaders like Angela Merkel from Germany. She has a more decent, a more measured leadership, leadership style, and she proved to do that in previous, in previous crises as well. So she uses an evidence-based decision-making style and the interesting thing is that she had a basically a, a, a notion or a note on TV, which she rarely does actually. And she didn't end this speech by saying, God blesses America, God blesses Germany, but rather saying, okay, in a very humble way, take good care of yourself and your loved ones. So you feel that this person cares about the people she leads and it's not just about herself. So what are the lessons we can learn from these leadership styles. The first is be at the front end of reality and accept it. You cannot change the truth. Be open regarding the truth. Have an intellectual integrity. So what is best for the organization and not only for you. And listen to unpopular advice. Even if you don't want to hear it, if this is the truth, you need to accept it and work with it. The second pattern or the second principle is to learn from patterns. Again, we can take the COVID-19 example, because what we experience now in Europe, for instance, what people experience in the United States is nothing that we don't have reference to. It started all the way end of last year in China, in Wuhan, and we have seen patterns of what has happened, what has worked to fight this virus, and learning from these patterns and applying the learnings to your own decision making is crucial as a good leader because you can shortcut. So what you need to do is to apply proven success strategies and therefore avoid failures or repeating failures. You shortcut reactions and decision making and you have to learn about complex adaptive systems and also biomimicry, so learning from nature. And that is something that we can help you with. So after this webinar, feel free to reach out to us because especially those things that I've marked in red are things we can also help you with afterwards if you encounter questions or challenges within changing organization. And here, for instance, learning from other systems that have built resilience, that have dealt with crises or are capable of dealing with crises and looking, for instance, into biological models, learning from how ecosystems can adapt so well to disturbance and change, that is something that we can help you with. The third leadership principle is an abundance mindset and a purpose-driven mindset. What do I mean by that? Many businesses run on just maximizing their profit for their own sake. This is nothing that is aspiring for people to work within that organization. But we also see that crises like the coronavirus, by the way, as well, but also especially, for instance, the climate crisis we see are a result of this ever growth-oriented behavior and mindset. So what we need is a switch in that mindset to create purpose, to create value to the world, because that is something that people can connect to. So Tesla, for instance, its first purpose is not to build cars, but it is to accelerate the world's transition to renewable energy. And they happen to build cars in order to do that. But it's not their prime mission to build cars, but really their big aspirational goal, their transformative purpose, their massive transformative purpose, as Salim Ismail likes to call it, is to accelerate the world's transition to renewable energy. So what you want to do in order to have an abundance and purpose-driven mindset is, the first thing is, in, an, in a digital age, in a 
data-driven age, you first need to use real-time data, but also intuition. You need both things in order to come to decisions. You need to surround yourself with people with a like-minded, abundance-driven mindset. So not based on scarcity and competition, but rather something, what can we get to together to create value, to have an impact, to make a notch in the universe? So you need to think big and with this value creation mindset, so civic engagement. And you want to favor abundance over scarcity. You need to have this exponential mindset. Again, so this is something you can train. This is something we can learn from cases. And this is something that is reflected in the principles and methods you use in your very organization to drive projects and decision making. Now let's come to the second point, to uncertainty. Uncertainty is created by this massive and rapid change we're witnessing, by the volatility. So if everything is uncertain, we need to give people kind of like stability where we can and this is something where we can upskill them where we can empower them where we need this mindset innovation away from a fixed mindset towards a growth mindset now the next leadership principle within that pillar is to protect connect with and support your people and a really wonderful example just could be witnessed a few days ago by simon sinek Many of you probably know Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek is the one who came up with the golden circle, um, which basically puts the why, the purpose of your organization in the very center and only then starts to think, what is the how and the what? And he is not working alone. He's a keynote speaker. He's a, uh, basically, he is a consultant, but he doesn't work just by himself, but he has a team within his Simon Sinek Inc. And this team is equally, like surprised by many things, especially because the business model he has run, which is him being on stages, him being at life events, is now also disrupted. The same thing that you're experiencing just in a different sector, basically. And he set up a call with his team. That's what you see the screenshot of here. And um, he said, and this is what you can find on YouTube, these are not unprecedented times. Crisis has happened before and it will happen again. But you're not alone. We are in this together and we all have to reinvent ourselves. So let's reinvent. Let's see this as an opportunity. So he cheered up his team and he said he even himself doesn't really know it all. He will figure it out together with them. So he gave them hold and support and courage and was thinking positively. So this is what you need to do with your people, with your organization. This together is better mindset. This is the hashtag he used also. If you want to check it out, you can find it on YouTube or LinkedIn. And you want to provide first and foremost psychological safety. But that being said, in a crisis like this, in a health crisis, you also have responsibility for the health safety of your employees and your people. So for instance, deciding early to leave them at home and work in a remote office is a good thing you could do. You need to be positive. You should be calm. You should be courageous and now, it is really important that it matters that you have a purpose. If you don't have a purpose as an organization, people all being remote, that will be very, very difficult to align them, to keep them together, to keep them engaged. And you want to seek face-to-face -face contact regularly, especially in virtual times, that you're online, that you're available, that you're approachable, that you can be seen and uh, felt like, and that you master virtual work. And we'll talk about virtual work a little bit later. Again, that's something we can dig deeper into uh, in, in other events, of course, as well. The next lesson we should take as a leader and the principle we should observe is to be authentic and transparent and to admit mistakes. Now, a very nice case study for this is what happened to KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, in 2018. In most of their UK and Ireland uh, um, uh, offices or stores, they ran out of chicken because they had a delivery issue um, from one of their from several of their warehouses that came together. And instead of just um, ignoring it, or instead of just closing the shops and don't, not caring about the customers, they thought with a very fast, uh, basically, response, they wanted to own this so-called fuck up. 
So they changed, as you can see, the letters are from KFC to FCK. So it's a fuck up. And they admitted they made a mistake in a very humble and humorous way. And by posting this online and social media and also starting basically uh, like a real time tracking for the customers, what the status of the chicken is by responding really swiftly and honestly to social media questions. They turned this around and people were not annoyed, but they really connected with this brand and appreciated the honesty, the transparency and the humbleness of this organization. So here they used this as an opportunity and they really branded themselves as a, like leaders who can deal with the crisis. So the lessons here are you cannot know it all and that's okay. Admit your mistakes. Combine humility with empathy towards the people with humor and creativity and establish an error and learning culture in your organization. And I've highlighted culture because culture has many aspects. And that's again, something we can go much deeper in because the cultural change is a, is really a process that takes time and requires knowledge of various approaches. But it is about here in this particular case, establish a learning culture where I can learn from these things. So how do I, for instance, not run out of chicken next time? The next principle you need to know is to empower your people. You really want to make sure they feel to have the authority to do things, to take decisions, to drive the vision forward. So what you want to do here is to not have a fixed mindset, but what we call a growth mindset. Everybody can grow. Everybody has huge potential and wants to develop. You want to break silos, especially nowadays. There are no silos anymore. We are all at home working remotely. So silos don't work. You have to collaborate. You want to encourage experimentation and creativity. People have great ideas, harness this potential, allow them to be creative. And that only works again if you established an error and learning culture, because if you try things, you may fail, but communicating these mistakes, communicating things that we can learn from is equally important, like a successful innovation. And as a leader, and that is very, very important, you need to listen actively. You need to have empathy. You need to build a culture of trust and honest conversation between you and the people you lead, but also between the people. And you only create something between people if you walk the talk, if you are the example as a leader. Now we move into the next pillar and that is about complexity. If complexity increases, you cannot possibly know and handle everything. So you want to collaborate. You want agile collaboration in order to create performant teams. So the first leadership principle within that pillar is to have a contextual awareness and fast decision making. So as a case study here, I picked the US Airways flight 1549, which in 2009, as you probably still remember, had to land in the Hudson River because there was a problem with the plane. And the pilot had to decide very, very quickly what he shall do. And he couldn't follow protocols because this was an unprecedented event. It was a crisis. It was a black swan event. So unprecedented, but huge impact and could potentially lead to the death of all the passengers and crew. So what he decided, he just used a, a heuristic. Can I reach any airport? And the answer was no. So instead of trying to fly back to the airport, he landed the plane safely in the water. And this was the only good decision he could take. He had to take it very swiftly and based on intuition and some of the heuristics, some of the data he had at hand. So key is to make tough decisions fast, but with the heart. Work with heuristics. So heuristics are shortcuts, mental shortcuts to come to a solution fast based on a few data that you have. You can't analyze. You have to decide intuitively based on some patterns that were maybe observed in the past. And for instance, know the Kinevin framework that Dave Snowden established, which is a framework for situational decision making. Also, that is something we can go into much more detail, but it describes different situations and contexts you can be in and how the approaches you use and the decision making strategies change within each of these contexts. Now, the next thing you should know as a leader is the Pareto principle, the 80% rule. Don't strive for perfection. You really want to go for speed, especially in times of crises. You want to validate quickly and learn forward. Not every decision will be the right one, 
but rather decision taking and moving forward than thinking about the perfect decision for too long and not acting at all. And here it is very helpful to also know agile approaches like design thinking, like lean startup, like other agile approaches. How do I quickly validate things? How do I work with the people, with the right people in the right moment? And how do I basically get prioritize those things that are really fundamental and deprioritize these things that can maybe wait a little bit longer? Now, the ninth principle for good leaders is to have an experimental mindset and to reinvent yourselves. Now, this is something that we all have to do. We all cannot go back to business as usual. Whoever does this right now, it's really, it will end in a catastrophic failure very soon because the crisis we had right now should be the biggest learning. The systems do not work anymore and we have to come up with alternatives. So just to give you an example of such crisis management, of reinventing yourself and doing something totally else by questioning the status quo, questioning what you're doing right now, is what happened to Alibaba in 2003. Because back then we had the SARS crisis. This was just another virus, just very similar. It just didn't reach this global spread. And in that time, again, people needed to stay in quarantine and all these things. And uh, Alibaba came up with the Taobao business model. Many of you maybe know it. You're closer to the, uh, to the Chinese ecosystem in Europe. Nobody knows this. But Taobao is the biggest e-commerce platform, mostly C2C in the world. It's the eighth most clicked website in the entire world. It's, a, it's massive. It's just not on the radar of many Western, especially US people. But this is something that came up in this crisis in 2003. So they came up with an entire new business model, disrupting what they've been before. And it's moved and morphed into the most successful e-commerce platform on the entire planet. So what you want to do is to be curious, learn about the crisis, learn about what caused the crisis, take risks, disrupt yourself and invest in the future. Think exponentially, be creative, and run, for instance, innovation sprints like exponential organizations. How can I really create not just an improvement of what I'm doing, but really come up with a disruptive business model by myself and question and challenge what I'm doing currently? Now, the last thing we want to look into is ambiguity. If we can't have all information, we still need to take decisions. So how do we create future business? How do we create this? How do we incorporate this exponential mindset with an agile fashion, using agile methods. And the first principle we need to use here is act rapidly, but think long-term. Just acting rapidly brings you into a short-term thinking. We need to think long-term as well. And here I want to bring an example from a German company. Company They make uh, basically cosmetic products. And here something really funny happened. Um, last year in November, a satire magazine called The Postillion posted an ad that said, this company has released a shampoo without knickknacks. So all the shampoos, you know, they are good for fatty hair and they're for short hair and for long hair and for brown hair. And they have this kind of extract and this kind of super special formula. And people are annoyed by this. So they came up, okay, this is without knickknack. It doesn't matter where these hairs grow on a woman or man. It's hair, it's keratin, and this is just without anything. So this was just a satire. Now, the marketing and PR department of the company, Henkel Schwarzkopf, saw that and within 24 hours, they said, okay, let's use this as an opportunity. They created 25 prototypes of that product, exactly looking like in the Satire magazine. Overnight, within 24 hours, they filmed a marketing film. They created a behind the scenes film and they started a micro scene where you could win one of these 25 products. So this created a huge buzz about this brand. Everybody wanted the shampoo and they actually started to produce this shampoo, which they're continuously and notoriously running out because shops cannot deliver the demand. So this is something that they did. This is like they earned a lot of media because the Postillion again, the original satire magazine posted that again, and they had a reach of over a million within a few days. And this is exceptional, very fast crisis response. So what you need to do here is to sense disruptions and changes quickly. You want to work in ecosystems because you can't do this alone. They had agencies that work together with them. You want to build reliable and trustworthy partnerships. And 
you need to know how to prototype, how to validate, how to iterate quickly in order to not make mistakes or learn from mistakes quickly. So the second last principle I want to talk about is thinking in systems. So you really need to embrace a systems thinking mindset. You want to focus not only, as I said earlier, on profit maximization, but on real value creation, value for your customers, value for your employees, but also value for society. So increasingly, and especially now after the crisis, businesses will be measured not only by their shareholder success, but also by the impact they will have on planet, on people. And you want to optimize your flow. So you need to think what is creating value within what I do, what my company does, and what is so-called waste that I need to eliminate and reduce. So how to optimize and prioritize the flow. You need to shift your perspective. You need to have a bird's perspective, but you still need to know enough to also take more detailed decisions. And you need to know about the interdependencies between different things. And you want to integrate feedback loops and use leverage points in order to intervene in the system. Feedback loops in order to prevent delays and catastrophic failure. And for that, you have to think in systems. And the last principle I want to bring up is to prepare for the next time, to build for resilience. What do I mean by this? As a case study, I have picked New York City. You all know in 2012, there was this terrible Hurricane Sandy that basically destroyed and devastated large parts of the city of Manhattan Island. And instead of rebuilding the city as it was before, because it proved to be not working because it was devastated, and you could just build your great infrastructure back and say, okay, then let's do it again next time. The city set out for a plan and wanted to rebuild for resilience. So they basically put out a tender and like a huge project for architects to apply, how can we mitigate these risks and how can we build resilient structures that can cope with flooding in the next time? So instead of building gray infrastructure, they incorporated now biology, natural systems that's like wetlands and these kind of things that can basically cope with water much better than a city with a gray and rigid infrastructure can do. So what you want to do here is, regarding your business, you want to diversify your business and your organization. If you put all your acts into one basket, it's very likely you will be disrupted by the next event, whatever it will be, the new startup, the next new technology, the next new virus. But if you diversify, you have more opportunities that you can stay resilient and continue to thrive. You want to incorporate feedback and response mechanisms. So the earlier you know something happens, the earlier you have a early warning or detection mechanism, the earlier you can respond. And you want to apply agile approaches. You don't want to have rigid, long decision line, long hierarchies, a very rigid model, but you want to be agile and you want to learn from living systems. Again, this is something we can support you with because especially when we talk about resilience, about preparedness, about adaptation, about networks, about decentralization, note all the words I just used. They are all biological terms. So we have to understand how does biology do this and how can we abstract these strategies to our organizations? Because an organization, that's what the term already says, is an organism, it's organization, it's something living, it's not a machine. And the machine metaphor has failed, we saw this now, we need to convert and transform our organizations into organisms. And that's something that we can learn big time from nature. So these are the four pillars you need to look at if you are a leader. Transformative purpose, what is the direction, what's the vision we have, a mindset innovation to empower and upskill your people, an agile mindset to enable collaboration and high-performance teams, and looking into how do I make my business future-proof? How do I incorporate and embrace exponential thinking? Now, I have summarized a few things, and these are four about leadership heuristics, and I need three more minutes to give you a few more things, and then we open the Q&A session. So leadership heuristics are shortcuts that help you in crises, but also in general decision-making. The first is, and the general heuristic is, adapt to change over following a plan. Maybe remember this quote, a plan is useless, planning is not. So the best plan will fail if the circumstances in which it was made change. And we're living in times of constant change. So yes, planning is important, it's crucial, but be ready to devise and change your plan if the context changes. 
The second heuristic is stop starting, start finishing. Now, during and after the crisis, even more than before, and you may have certainly experienced that before already, focus on what is necessary. Focus on things that should be done and can be done given the capacity you have. Multitasking kills efficiency. And we, in our uh, workshops, we sometimes run very nice simulations showing this black and white, how you massively decrease time to market and productivity by not multitasking, but by focusing and knowing what you can do and prioritizing right, the right way. The next heuristic is Pareto. We heard this before, Pareto principle, the 80% rule over perfection. It's better to get something done than strive to perfection and never end it. And the final thing is to focus on value creation. So whatever you do in your organization, think, is it creating value for our customers? Is it creating value for our employees and society? If not, don't do it. Eliminate things that do not create value because they just dis distract you. They just take budget and think of value creation and not valuation. I really like this quote because this is this purpose-driven mindset that we need more and more, especially now after the crisis. So to finally, and I, do, I will give you the slides so I'm not go into much detail, I want to give you a few notes about how you can make your virtual work, your remote work more effective. The first thing is, how do you improve and boost the outcome and the effectiveness of your virtual meetings? So only invite the people that are relevant for this conversation, don't invite everyone. Have a purpose of that meeting, make it explicit what the intended results are and have an agenda. Be in time, it's very fundamental. Be respectful to people, be in time and end in time. Have everyone the cameras on because face-to-face -face is so important, especially if you're socially distanced right now. Have the mics off except for this person who's speaking. Do a check-in, how everybody feels or do a little warm-up in the beginning. Have clear roles like moderation. There should be a moderation. Uh, maybe someone who's responsible for tech if something doesn't work, somebody who takes note to document what happens, and maybe somebody who's responsible to sense team dynamics if something needs special care. Be to the point, time is crucial. Focus on decision making and with some clear outcome that you defined before, summarize and check out. Now, events you should use, especially now, you should also use them in the real world or daily or weekly stand up. So to check in regularly where you stand as a team, what you're doing, what you have been doing, what are the bottlenecks. Replenishment meetings or backlog planning. So basically meetings where you plan what's coming up next and why and prioritize the work that needs to be done in the next week or two. Do reviews of things you have been doing, celebrate successes, discuss about things that didn't work and do retrospectives. So this is not about the product or the content you have worked on, but the process and the people dynamics. Then do, especially now in these times of crisis times, what I call a Corona retro. So get together with the team in regular intervals and reflect how are we doing with our virtual work? What are things that work and don't work? How can we improve it? And also make room for informal chatter, for informal conversations that we usually have in tea rooms. So create a virtual tea room where people can but don't have to sign up to. And you meet once a day, make it a routine, make it a habit. Maybe you cook together. Whatever it is, create rituals, create virtual environments where people feel connected and not just working efficiently. And then have a horizontal and vertical exchange. What I mean by this is don't stick to hierarchies. Don't think in silos, but be seen as a leader, encourage regular engagement between the people and lift that and walk the talk and have a Corona task force, a change team that takes over responsibility for new approaches, new tools, new things that is basically your leading edge within the organization for the change. So the final slide I want to show you, and this is very short, uh, about agile tools, what you can use. You need to consider a few domains and certainly are using now by now already some of them. Uh, you need to think, how do we do project management? So if you had a Kanban board, again, that is something that you should have coming from the Agile to basically reflect on how your work makes things transparent. You should bring this in the virtual world. There are tools like Jira or Trello or Microsoft Planner. Even you can use, I have some clients that work with Microsoft Planner. And there are other tools too. These are just a few examples where you can visualize and make transparent what you're working on, what are the priorities, and what are the things that do not work. Regarding communication, avoid emailing, especially a huge CC culture. Use rather structured chats, 
something like Slack or Microsoft Teams, where you can categorize who is part of this conversation, where you can categorize what is the topic we're talking about. It's much better in terms of structure. It's much better, better in terms of chronic because you can search for things and basically onboard someone about the history of what happened and have regular face-to-face -face contact, for instance, via Zoom or other tools that you may use in order to connect with people and not just write and read about people. And finally, when it comes to co-creation, use digital whiteboards or co-creation platforms like Google Drive or other things that you have already. It could be um, uh, Zoom, again, it has a whiteboard section, Mural, Miro, they, uh, they all have whiteboards, but um, there are also co other co-creation uh, things like OneNote, where you can together collectively work on the same document. So that was it from my side. This is what I wanted to share regarding leadership and crisis, how you see crisis as an opportunity, and how you can improve virtual work. With that, I would like to start the Q&A session. And for that, we have a structured chat here that uh, we can basically now publish on our screens. And uh, the team from PwC, for whom I'm very grateful to organize this and do this in collaboration with, will now help me to curate your questions. So please post your questions in the chat now, and we will answer some of the questions that you have immediately. So please post your questions in the chat you see on the right bottom side. As soon as we see questions coming up, we will publish them as or cluster them and publish them, and then I'll happily answer them right now. So the first question came in here, can you explain intellectual integrity in the context of the crisis? So intellectual integrity means uh, be true to the reality, to the facts and to the data. Um, and again, I brought this example before, this was the first case I exemplified, uh, Donald Trump versus Angela Merkel. Uh, one first denying the facts, um, rather engage in wishful thinking or blaming, uh, and only very slowly and way too late responding to what is the actual reality. So intellectual integrity means uh, to be true to what is, to be true to um, the data and the facts that there are, have scientific advisors, have advisors and experts around you that help you with this, because of course you're not an expert in all topics, and then take your decisions on this and be transparent to the information you have. Don't try to deny it because you can't deny reality. Any other questions, please type them into the chat you see below. Okay, how fast can the recovery process be expected? Um, that's a good question. It's very hard for me. I'm, well, I'm not an analyst, and I think even analysts will fail. Um, and it depends on what you're looking at. Um, and what do you mean by recovery? That's very interesting. What I, will, what I do not think, and in my humble opinion, and uh, truly and by heart do not hope, is that we want to fall back into the old system. They have proven to fail and they will fail in the future. So recovery doesn't mean to go back into business as usual. Um, so what all organizations, all societies now need to learn is to come up with strategies, with mechanisms that help us cope with crises better in the future to rethink their systems. So this is a process that takes time. And this is a cultural change. And cultural change, I don't know, only mean on societal level, but also in organizations. And that's a process. You can't do this overnight. But the unique opportunity you all have right now is you will speed up your cultural transformation right now. Before cultural process, uh, transformation was a very long process, 
because some people may not have understood why we need to change. I think now it's crystal clear for everyone that things don't work. You have a reference that everybody experienced firsthand. So now we have a catalyst and like a speed up mechanism referencing to what just happened and everybody experienced to say, okay, we need to change. Everybody is engaged. So I believe recovery and by that, I mean a reinvention of our systems will go much faster than it would have just happened half a year ago. How do you, that's a nice one too. How do you forecast for uncertainty? Well, you cannot plan for uncertainty, obviously, um, uh, because you don't know. Um, but the best thing you can do, there are a few mechanisms you can use. The first thing is um, uh, use collaboration. Don't build silos. The bigger the network of sensing is, if you wish, the better you know what's happening and sense changes, which requires good communication and collaboration, the faster you can react. So that's the first thing. Collaboration makes you reactive. The second thing is um, you want to build for resilience because no matter what you do, you will not always preempt a crisis. But at least then if a crisis happens, you want to be able to um, really uh, react fastly and uh, have mechanisms in place that sustain you and that don't make you collapse. And the third thing that's important is agile approaches. Don't go back to the waterfall approaches, to the planning and the, the one year plan and to your quarterlies, but rather think, how can I be more agile, observant and react to what happens? Because then you become what we call proactive. It's what we call in biology pre-adaptation. So it's a mechanism by which you develop already strategies that may be just the right ones that prove useful in a crisis that you could not foresee. Um, let's see, let's take this one. Does reinvention and innovation, uh, is it at a cost? Hence, how practical is it for most businesses? Okay, uh, so I guess that what this means, this question is now people and organizations are already challenged financially. Um, they have maybe uh, like had huge losses now. How practical is it to reinvest? Well, it's a valid question. Um, and there may be businesses that cannot do this right now. Um, and there may be, and there will be businesses that do not survive. Also, this is clear and we have to be honest about this. The question is, if you do not do it, will you be ever existing in the future? So the question is not, can I afford it, but how can I afford it? Um, and you need to think about, okay, how can I maybe do certain things that I have been doing before from the business model and make them more lean? So how can I, basically reallocate budgets that I needed in order to run the previous business model that I can now put into as an investment into innovation and reinvention. Or how can I harness um, abundance? I was talking about that before. Things that are obvious, that are uh, like available, um, that I can harness now, that I can tap into now, or I can use the power of people, the power of commitment, the power of new technologies in order to do things in a much simpler and faster way than I have been doing it before with my old business model. So yes, innovation comes with an investment, not necessarily always with money also eventually, but first and foremost with an investment in maybe developing people, creating a new mindset, embracing opportunities and taking risks. And if you don't do this, you may not exist and then you don't make any money at all. It is a challenging time, but uh, those who will be successful will be those who reinvent themselves. So here's one more. Um, what would you say is the most important thing we can do to keep employees motivated during a crisis like this? Well, I mentioned it mostly. Be present, be available. Um, sense, be, listen to your people, be empathetic. Listen how your people feel, be an example, be calm, be positive, and be authentic and honest. So you don't have to know it all. You don't have to tell them, okay, this is how we do it afterwards. I already have a master plan. If you're having this mindset, first of all, this master plan will not work out. I can promise you because you cannot come up by yourself with a master plan. Second, um, again, this would be old behavior and people don't even need this master plan. People want to see you as a leader that you're equally affected by this crisis, that you are though keeping calm and staying with a positive attitude to encourage them to keep on doing. You want to foster collaboration. 
you want to refocus on the purpose. And that, again, I cannot stress it more. Your organization needs to have a fundamental transformative purpose. If your previous purpose was, okay, let's be more profitable. We are striving for efficiency. That is nothing that ever motivated people. And it will not keep your people motivated right now. If you were in that mindset, now is the time to change. So even if you don't have this big purpose, try to find it quickly or try to find it collaboratively afterwards and reinvent your organization. But first and foremost, now stay with the people, listen to them, be an example and be present. Be present in face-to-face -face meetings. So looking at the time, we are now at the end of this webinar. There are more and more questions coming in and I can't answer them all. To respect your time, because that's what I'm also preaching when I say have successful virtual meetings um, and that not those people who want to leave feel bad now leaving in time, I would like to close here. We are very happy to answer any open question you have in the future. Please stay in touch with us. Please stay in touch with the PwC Academy, with the people who invited you to our webinar. We have many formats that we created and will create to help you, to support you. And not only in the real world with workshops, but we also build a lot of online tools right now. We're just in the process of making uh, and creating online workshops, online engagement sessions, online coachings. Uh, so stay in touch with us. We hope we could create value for you. This was recorded. It will be available afterwards. And uh, we're happy to share more information with you. With that, I would like to end. I thank you very much for joining us, for being with us, for your engaging questions. We wish you best of luck, and we are here to support you. Thank you very much, and see you very soon. Bye-bye.